Hey everyone, uh, thanks for joining our session today at Kubernetes Conformance, where we've combined the intro and the deep dive this time. So first kind of uh, 15 to 20 minutes will be sort of, will be introductory and we're gonna gradually get deeper and deeper. So uh, apologies if you're here for the deep dive section, you can just tune out for a little bit. And, and if you're more interested in the intro topics, no one's gonna be offended if you decide uh, uh, that, that you'd like to be somewhere else uh, in 30 minutes or so. Um, and with that, uh, so I'm William Dennis. So I work on Conformance uh, as part of the Google team. Um, but I'd like to first welcome Dan on stage, who's going to just give a bit of an update on, on the CNCF side of things. Thanks. Do I have two slides here or not? You have one. Yeah. Great. Um, hi, this is the key, uh, the money slide, as we said. So my name's Dan Kahn. I'm executive director of CNCF, and uh, we launched this uh, conformance program back in uh, September of 2017, and I'd say that it has exceeded our wildest expectations in terms of uh, getting the entire industry to um, buy into this. So it's 84 certified Kubernetes partners today. And uh, there remains huge amounts of activity. If you follow the KDS conformance uh, repo, we get people registering new ones and uh, occasional ones falling off. And so it's a very active uh, program. I think uh, the conformance working group deserves a lot of credit for uh, coming up with a program that is um, both uh, doesn't depend on a lab, that each vendor is, um, is able to uh, do the conformance test themselves, but the sort of subtle, um, powerful aspect of it is that any user can come along later and confirm that that uh, product is still conformant. And so there's a um, distributed uh, crowdsource aspect to the enforcement that um, I think is, is subtle, but, but really quite powerful and important. Um, and, you know, the program continues to evolve. Uh, somewhat shockingly, we just last week figured out that there was a missing step in the uh, checks that we were doing, but no one it hadn't come up yet, and so we fixed it. Um, so, uh, when we created the program, we had the specific idea of profiles in mind, and we haven't uh, done a profile yet. I'll also mention that if you think of the analogy to Android, uh, today we're only certifying the phones. We're not certifying the Android applications. I uh, brought this up again with our governing board on Monday and had absolutely no interest in doing the other side of the certification. So remains something that we could do in the future, but there's just does not seem to be a business need for it or uh, uh, have it, our membership does not seem interested in it. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, hand it back over, but really excited to be part of this. I guess the very last thing I'll say is of all the CNCF programs, uh, KubeCon obviously being a huge one and Kubernetes certified service providers and uh, lots of other things that we've done, our landscape and such, I think that this certified Kubernetes program has probably had the biggest overall impact on the cloud native ecosystem in terms of preventing fragmentation and uh, ensuring that there's one platform that everyone can work with. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. And uh, yeah, that last line can go on everyone's uh, performance packets and uh, <laughs> resumes, et cetera. Yeah. Great. So uh, let me just give a quick overview of the program for, for those that are, that are new to it. Um, certified Kubernetes is a software uh, conformance program. and more or less, uh, vendors can just certify with the CNCF that their Kubernetes products conform to the community test suite. Kind of consists of two parts, a, a technical test suite that people run in their cluster, and then a, a legal aspect to it where, where they submit the test results uh, and, and they get this uh, shiny badge on the right. Uh, so why did we actually do this in the first place? Um, the, the driving reason is really to, to guarantee portability and interoperability as, as best we can. Uh, so this is more or less the promise of Kubernetes. Um, and we wanted to make sure that this was actually going to, going to be delivered. We want to make sure that if you can you know, deploy your application just fine on GKE, that you can take it and run it on-prem or run it somewhere else. Another one was predictability. So when there are differences, we sort of recognize that there will be differences. We, we want users to have an easy understanding of, of what to expect when they're migrating. So this is, Dan mentioned profiles briefly. This is where the, the profile concept uh, may come in in the future where there may be some differences between clouds, like some that support, say, Windows, and some that don't. Um, and we want these things to kind of be obvious and discoverable. And the last one, uh, but, but not the least, actually, is that we wanted to make sure that 
their users would always be able to upgrade and, and take advantage of all the latest features of Kubernetes. So I think one of the potential failure conditions for the, the project actually as a whole, like Kubernetes, is everyone just locks in at like 1.10 or something. And you know, 1.10 becomes like the version that everyone uses and then you know, all the great stuff, all the, all the great work that everyone's doing um, basically goes to waste because everyone's just using 1.10. So one of the things that we, we tried to build in this program was kind of incentivizing people to, to stay up to date and make sure that, that users can ultimately get the benefits of the Kubernetes community that everyone's working so hard on. So looking at it by different classes of users, if you're an end user, uh, conformance helps you avoid the vendor lock-in. Um, so you can, you can verify that the environment is honoring the API contract. As Dan said, like one of the really advantages of this program is that you can run this test suite yourself and just verify that your own vendor is, is actually conformant. Uh, if you're a vendor, um, you can add the conformance to just to validate that you're actually delivering real Kubernetes to your users. And if you're an ISV, I think this is a, this is a very useful one here. If, if you're shipping software to, to customers that they're, they're then running, um, if they encounter any problems, which they will, I'm sure, and they'll complain to you, one of the great things about conformance is you can actually ask your customers to first verify that their clusters are conformant before you spend like weeks and weeks like debugging their environment. So it's kind of a sanity check, like, you know, is this environment actually Kubernetes before we really get into the details? Uh, why bother certifying? So, you, so anyone can just run the test suite. Um, certification is an extra step after that point. Uh, involves an agreement with the CNCF. Uh, so why would you do that extra step? Well, one is you know you get to provide that assurance to your customers that it's real Kubernetes, uh, and you get that cool badge. And last but not least, um, this is extremely powerful actually. You get to add the word Kubernetes to your product. So Kubernetes is a trademark owned by the CNCF. So normally you wouldn't be able to have you know, Kubernetes in your product. So like if I wanted to create you know, Williams Kubernetes Engine, WKE, following the uh, three <laughs> that acronym can mention, uh, I wouldn't be able to do that legally. Uh, at least I wouldn't be able to call it Kubernetes. However, if I certified that, uh, then I could. Um, Just so you get to, but don't have to. Right, you don't have to. It is, it is optional, but, uh, but potentially quite valuable. In terms of the actual program itself, um, the, the ownership is sort of split into two parts in the community. Uh, one part is the actually what conformance is, so what tests, you know, what is the Kubernetes API that we're testing? Um, that is governed by SIG Architecture, one of the special interest groups. And then we have the conformance work group, which is uh, the people here, although, although there is a lot of overlap. Um, we actually kind of run the process itself and trademark policy and things like that. All right. so. Let me do a quick demo just to show how easy this is. Um, and I think like even if you're a user, this is it's kind of valuable because you can just you can just test this on your own cluster. So to get started, you need to download Sunaboy. Uh, and rather than unless you like are a glutton for punishment and love building Go code, uh, you can just grab one of these pre-built binaries, which I did earlier. And <coughs> I'm gonna run that and we'll see what happens. So it's as simple as Sunaboy run. And what this is doing is it's launching uh, a container into my cluster with all of the end-to-end -end tests prepackaged. And it's automatically going to be running the entire conformance end-to-end -end test suite. Um, to see the status, I can just run Sunaboy status. I'm running on Windows because I have an HDMI port in my laptop and I don't, I don't have to carry out a, a dongle. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, you run Sunaboy status uh, and, and just proving the, the cross platform. Yeah, you know, the, the, the great thing about Docker is as a developer, like I can build Linux containers um, and I really, really, the operating system doesn't matter anymore, which I think is wonderful. So, um, yeah, more or less, this, this, that, that's it. I, that, that's all I need to do. Um, now, this will actually take like three hours, so I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bore you all with that. But what? But sixty minutes, I think, is a bit optimistic. At least, at le <laughs> let's say 
order of magnitude, yeah, it's, it's about right. Um, so what you'll be looking for as a user is uh, you can just run Cinnaboy status, and once that running uh, command there says complete, then, then you're good to go. Um, at any time, you can also see the logs, so you can check those out. Um, okay, so in order to not waste all that time waiting for those results, I am going to get one that I've done earlier. So once once it actually completes, uh, you would run, where is it, uh, Cineboy get results, Cineboy retrieve. So what this will do is this will um, basically just download the, the logs, the test results from the cluster. Um, so here we are. And the results are in plugins, E2E, results. All right, and you can see there are two files there. Uh, let's inspect the E2E log. So I just ran this this morning. Basically, that exact command I showed you earlier, ran it this morning. Uh, so this is what happens once you wait the necessary 60 plus minutes. So a lot of logs. Uh, the important thing here at the bottom, um, 200 passed, no failed. So that basically just means that this cluster is conformant uh, to the best of our knowledge. Of course, as you'll hear later in the deep dive, there are certainly some gaps in this that, that we're trying to fill. Um, but for now, that's what we have. All right, so that's the technical side of it. Then when, if you're, a, if you're an actual um, vendor and you have a distribution or a, um, or a platform or an installer of Kubernetes, you can basically just take these, those two files on the disk here, the E2E log and the XML, uh, package that up with a little um, bit of metadata about your service, submit that to our repo. Uh, you do need to be a CNCF member. Um, and that's it, you can be certified. So I hope I've demonstrated just how easy it is to actually run these tests. Um, and whether or not you're a user just wanting to validate your vendor or whether you're a vendor and you actually want to certify. Uh, and then you can inspect the results here. So say for 1.13, um, GK is already there, so I won't need to submit those results I just got. But, but theoretically, um, this log file from eight days ago should, should be, be pretty similar. Okay. And with that, let's go back to the agenda. And we have Aaron. Hi, everybody. I am Aaron of Sigbeard, also known as Aaron Kirkenberger. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Sig Testing. I'm also a Kubernetes steering committee member. I'm actively interested in seeing what we can do to improve the state of conformance testing. So as William alluded to earlier, there are potentially some gaps in conformance testing. We'd like to make sure that when we say something is certified Kubernetes, that that is meaningful that we've adequately exercised enough of Kubernetes functionality to give users the guarantee that all of their workloads are portable. Uh, so I'm, even though this is the intro part, I'm gonna just dive deep right away <laughs> because I have to bounce out of here uh, soon for another panel. Uh, so here, it, this is sort of an update of a talk I gave in KubeCon Shanghai called Adventures in Conformance where I sort of laid out a bunch of charts and data. I've reduced it down a bit to talk about the number of tests we've added on a quarterly basis and to show that, hooray, it's always been going up and to the right. Um, however, my involvement in actively pushing all of this forward kind of stopped in Q1 and Q2 of 2019. I like to think maybe I had a little bit of an effect there. <laughs> um, but like if you dig deeper into the tests as well, there's a little more reasoning behind this. Uh, so all of the tests that were added to 110 uh, were largely either API machinery or uh, workloads related tests that were all promoted or written by Googlers employed by Jago because that's where most of the API machinery and workload related uh, people uh, live. Uh, in 111, it was basically the same story, but we didn't have anybody actively driving this effort. In 112, uh, I came on board. And I started to suggest that we should take a look at all of the behaviors that are being exercised by tests that look at behavior just at the node level. So what do pods do on a kubelet? You know, let's look at how we run the things. Let's see how we make sure the things are active and ready, uh, things of that nature. And so we spent most of our time 
picking up tests that were already in our end-to-end -end test corpus and turning them into conformance tests. This largely involved making sure that the tests be, uh, exercised behavior that was conformant. So was it the sort of behavior we, we expected to work across all clusters? Um, or were the tests being a little too uh, white box about it? We also had to make sure that the tests were written the correct way to make sure that they didn't exercise, uh, they didn't look for the functionality in API fields that weren't guaranteed to uh, change between versions. Uh, so for example, anything that looked for the way that pods were scheduled or the way that pods started up by looking for events that were generated by that is not really a conformance test because events are not actually a versioned API object. They can change at any time across different Kubernetes versions. So any test written that way, not a great test. 113 was awesome. I was in full swing here. Also, I had a talk about conformance at Shanghai, so I was really incentivized to make sure we pushed extra, extra hard. Uh, but really, the bulk of the tests here uh, are Kube CTL, Kube Control, Kube Cuddle, or Kube Ectl, depending on your pronunciation of choice, uh, tests. Um, and the reason all of these tests got promoted in 113 uh, is because I went poking around why Sonaboy, the, the tool that William introduced, uh, was using an end-to-end -end test image that was built by Heptio, rather than an end-to-end -end test image that was built by the Kubernetes project. And it turns out the Kubernetes project didn't have one of those end-to-end -end test images. So we started working on that in 1.13. And why did uh, Heptio's image exclude kube control tests uh, from conformance? Well, it turns out there was something about the way that those tests worked uh, that they didn't really, at Kubernetes 1.8 or 1.9, um, they didn't function well inside of a cluster, right? The way Sonaboy works is it takes uh, a container that has all of the end-to-end -end tests and then it schedules it inside of the tester, or sorry, inside of the cluster. And then, so it's sort of like the cluster tests itself, you know, the call is coming from inside the house. Uh, I, I sometimes feel like a more uh, authentic end user experience is one where the tests are run from outside the cluster because I generally interact from my clusters in the real world or usually from my laptop or something. And the kube control tests worked just fine there but since we now live in a world where scheduling the tests inside of your cluster is far simpler, and Sonaboy is the documented way of doing conformance tests, we were sort of beholden to figuring out what was the problem. Why couldn't these tests work inside of the cluster? And it turns out we figured that out back in like 1.10, 1.11, something like that. Uh, but I found this regular expression that was still excluding the kube control tests. So we now live in a world where the regular expression for what tests should run uh, is owned by upstream. The image that runs the tests is owned and built by upstream. So as a result, we got way more. Uh, then 114 happened. And I was the release lead for 114. And somehow I had these, this hope or dream that like because I was the release lead, I would have the power to push through as much stuff as possible. Uh, but that also apparently meant I didn't really have a whole lot of time to focus on conformance. Um, and also, some of you may have heard that 114 was the release of Kubernetes that said that Windows server nodes are now GA. And so it turns out we spent most of our time in 114 talking about what GA really meant, especially in the context of conformance. And you'll see that one of those uh, tests up there has a little tag called uh, Linux only. Uh, and that's because we decided to, to handle the difference in behaviors or functionality or what have you between Linux nodes and Windows Server nodes uh, by sort of triaging off functionality that could only ec be exercised on Linux nodes as, as Linux only. And this is still like a thing we're going to have to work through, right? Windows Server nodes are not conformant. Um, but they do pass a bunch of end-to-end -end tests, and they are supported enough to be called GA. But we still need to go through the exercise of figuring out, you know, what are the behaviors that we would expect to work on nodes, even if they may be implemented in slightly different ways. So the canonical example I trot out here is file system permissions. Yeah, but both operating systems have file, uh, file system permissions to say what you can read and write. 
but they're specified in different formats. There's no way I can take a Linux file system permissions and apply them to a Windows server node. There are also a number of things around uh, host networking and the way that DNS works the, that require that, you know, we're gonna have to break that functionality up and start to chunk it up into two lists about what's the functionality that will just never, ever, ever, ever work on Windows server nodes, and what's the functionality that will, but just not yet. And it could be because of how the tests are written, could be that they're exercising things in a way that doesn't work well across hosts. Um, or it could be that the functionality will magically appear in a later version of Windows Server. And so maybe we want to talk about, uh, I think later somebody here will talk about validation. You know, how can we uh, figure out how uh, valid a given node is for different features? Um, and now we're on to 115. Uh, I'm still not actively pushing stuff forward, uh, but instead the, the Kubernetes architecture SIG, which ostensibly is the special interest group in charge of defining what Kubernetes is, uh, has decided to put together a sub-project, which is a group of individuals working towards a common goal all under the auspices of this SIG with a regularly recurring meeting at a cadence more frequent than once a month, but less frequent than weekly a meeting dedicated solely to talking about conformance testing and improving it and driving it forward rather than talking about and also all of the other architectural concerns of Kate's. Uh, we also kind of finally created a backlog and a project board uh, with uh, issues for all of the things that we are currently working on. Everything is kind of consistently labeled these days. If you want to work on anything related to conformance, you look in GitHub and you look for anything that has the area conformance label. Uh, and so you can see we actually have uh, conformance tests that are coming from a variety of areas, apps and network and storage and, and node and stuff. Uh, most of these are promotions of existing tests, uh, but that's because we have a belief that there are many, many tests out there that are worth promoting. We just need to actually take the time to go through it. So one other way we thought about measuring conformance tests or conformance test coverage, you know, I just listed off a bunch of test cases, but it could be they're all exercising the same thing. Uh, so one way we thought about uh, figuring out what do they actually exercise is API coverage. Uh, this graph is a little dense, but again, what I'm trying to show you is everything is going up and to the right, which is always great. Uh, and the yellow line is the one we care about the most because this is coverage of APIs which are considered stable or GA and won't change. Uh, and they're also part of the core namespace. So they're all the, the resources of Kubernetes that we expect to exist absolutely everywhere. They're not extensions, they're not optional, they will always be present. And so at least from an API perspective, if I look at all of the endpoints available on a Kubernetes server and all of the verbs I can throw at those endpoints, we're hitting over 50% of them uh, with the beta of 115 that was recently cut. So good job everybody. Is that from API Snoop or different? Yes, so this is basically API Snoop. Uh, that said, the reason I didn't show you the pretty shiny API Snoop graphs is just for consistency. I'm using the same numbers from Shanghai from an older version of API Snoop, but it's the same thing. Uh, so this last graph, I just kind of wanted to talk about, like, uh, this is sort of the story of SIG architecture getting involved and the story of us uh, actually ramping up our efforts to improve uh, conformance. So the yellow bar is uh, any issue or pull request in GitHub that has the label area conformance applied that has been updated within that time period. And so you can see that we are starting to create and update and talk about and merge and discuss exponentially more issues every quarter, uh, which is great and encouraging that you know, we are actually starting to build momentum here. The much lower bar in red are all the pull requests that, are, that have the label area conformance that are merged. Uh, pull requests related to conformance can be merged in multiple repos across the project. You know, we could be updating docs that describe what conformance is and why it's meaningful. Uh, we could be updating some of the test jobs that automatically run conformance tests and post them to test grid. Uh, we could be actually merging uh, new conformance tests uh, or we could be promoting existing tests to conformance. And finally, the lower blue line, uh, the blue line there uh, is all of the pull requests that actually touch the conformance directory inside of Kubernetes, Kubernetes. Uh, these are merged PRs, not long-standing open PRs. 
Uh, but these are PRs that either are promoting a conformance test or promoting an end-to-end -end test into conformance, or they may be PRs that are touching the tooling related to conformance tests. So we have some tooling that, that walks and lints the source code in Kubernetes of all of its end-to-end -end tests to make sure that they are or are not applicable to conformance. And the thing that kind of bugs me is we, we don't really have a lot of the blue ones. The blue ones are kind of the, the goal here. And so I'd like to kind of figure out how we can convert all of our, you know, enthusiastic, inspired discussion and conversation about conformance into actually merging things that improve the state of conformance. Um, the fact that we are building up the momentum uh, seems great and makes me think that perhaps if I like wait another quarter or two, we're gonna see like that yellow bar convert into a much larger bluer bar down the line. Uh, but I think I look forward to Srini and John and some other folks talking about, you know, how can we do this in a scalable way? Because I think ultimately there's still some review bandwidth bottlenecks that we have. And I, I think we could benefit from documenting, you know, uh, how better to onboard folks who want to help out with conformance. Now that we have this reoccurring conformance definition subproject within SIG architecture, for people who show up, what do they do? How can they help out? How can we push stuff forward? The other thing I'll say about the, the way that group is working right now is I feel like there's an awful lot of time spent taking a look at existing pull requests and just um, opportunistically saying, why don't we try promoting this to conformance? Or why don't we try promoting that to conformance? You know, just picking up a lot of chaff to show like, look, we're trying, we're really trying. But if we don't actually grow the pool of reviewers who can say, yes, that's ready, or no, that isn't, that just clogs our queue and actually wildly uh, increases the latency of getting anything actionable done. So I'd really like to figure out, you know, how can we make sure that when we pick something up, that it's actually going to be meaningful as opposed to getting lost in uh, going back and forth. I didn't have time to collect the stats on this, but I, I suspect that a lot of that yellow bar, that, you know, comments and discussion on any open issue or PR is actually a lot of back and forth about why this isn't working this particular way. So I'm sure a lot of this represents the discussion we've had about uh, Windows versus Linux and how to work on all of that. We are making progress on all that. I'm encouraged to see that. But anyway, that's sort of the state of today. Most of the stuff I said is not in the speaker's notes, so please watch the recording if you missed this. <laughs> I just figured I'd give you some pictures to look at while I talked. Uh, these are the sources of the data that I showed you. Uh, the last two links are spreadsheets that are uh, accessible to all. The first is the repo I used to build the data and generate those graphs and stuff for KubeCon uh, China. That's it. Thanks. Could I get one question? Yeah, one question. What would it take to get a quantum improvement in test coverage over the next 12 months? Uh, Talk it out amongst yourselves during the deep dive. I, th I think there are some suggestions that are constructive, and we'll we'll go from there. But I unfortunately have to run. Yeah, two hard questions. Just say twice the budget. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not just more people. It's yeah. it's being more yeah, effective more in the work that we do. Maybe. All right, thank you, Aaron. All right, and ne next up is uh, Hippie Hacker to talk about uh, how we uh, quantify the, the test coverage and, and the various components um, using the API snip tool. Thank you. Let me test my button. Okay, it works. So our journey here has been to identify um, our usage and what it means to have a conformant cluster. And API Snoop was brought along to try to use some of the features built into Kubernetes to observe those behaviors so that we can start answering some of those deeper questions. Um, these are some of the questions that we thought were meaningful. And uh, I may see if I can click on the things to show you the the visualization of those results. But one of those questions that uh, we came up with was, what if we knew which stable APIs were being used but not tested? And um, we'll try clicking here and see if that launches on the web. It does. Hooray. Yay! 
Yay <laughs> for the web. Um, this graph here um, is from our end-to-end -end conformance tests. It is for our release blocking jobs. So this is what we use to stop broken releases from making it to our end users. So this is one way of defining, if it gets past here, people are consuming it. And I've limited with some of our filters over here that we're not looking at anything hit by our end-to-end -end test suite. So all of these 95 endpoints were not touched by our end-to-end -end test suite. And this is zoomed in to just stable. So this green area here, I'll move down so you can see the, maybe I have to zoom out just slightly. The legend down here shows that the green is stable. So not only is this things that are used during our release blocking jobs, it's the stable things that are used by our release blocking jobs. And if we were gonna try to prioritize endpoints, I think things that are we use during our release blocking jobs that are not tested are probably a good list. Um, I wanna scroll down here. I think if I can figure out how to, how to scroll down. This is the list of endpoints. So if you wanted some quick insight as to what we might should prioritize, this first link is not a bad list. It's not prioritized yet, but that's okay. We can start looking at other metrics to, to prioritize that stuff. I'm gonna go back to our slides now. So this is the stable. So what could we do if we knew this? We could prioritize writing <laughs> tests. Our uh, next question is going beyond stable, but stable core. And we ask a different question about our stable core. Um, stuff that's already tested, but it's not yet conformant. Because these are those easy upgrades that we saw that nice list of, of, of things in 1.13. We're like, ooh, we've got tests. Let's just mag them as conformant. But we, we do need to inspect those and ensure that they are. So we decided to pull those out. Stable core? That's a good list of endpoints that if we're actively using them during the release blocking job and their, their tests, it's probably a good place that we should look for the using them in conformance. So I'll zoom in on this list. I'll click and launch. We'll add to the sidebar at some point these, these lists. But these are 30 different endpoints. And if you mouse over, you can see where they are or scroll down. If I can figure out how to scroll down. There we go. There's the endpoint list. You get the idea. And then we go, um, if we were able to do that, these got these, these 30 existing tests that are stable core that we could upgrade by conformance, upgrade to, to conformance. And this last question that we have answered is what if we knew which completely untested APIs were hit by the core Kubernetes components? So this, what we're asking here is not stuff around the EDE tests, but the specific user agents that are core to Kubernetes. This is core Kubernetes talking to itself that we don't hit at all during our tests. So we'll click on this next link, and you'll notice over here there's a, a regular expression for kube-star. And if, I, if we look at, what is that batch? Well, we'll drop down the match. This is Kube API server, Kube controller manager, Kube scheduler, and Kube proxy in there. There are likely others that you could come up with your own regular expression to, to search inside these audit logs and see what was of interest. This is not focusing on core. This is all the endpoints. But there's 125 endpoints that are being hit by the cluster itself that are primed for writing some test of some type. Um, and likely, since we're talking about the core components of Kubernetes itself, these are high important endpoints to, to add test coverage for. So um, again, you can see that list. These three questions give us a prioritized list of endpoints to test. And so far, this journey that we've been in on is kind of focused on that metric. We've seen the, uh, the information provided by uh, Aaron on, we're going up and to the right, 
and and that that's great. Um, and I and I and I think this we need to continue to get to a point where we have a hundred percent coverage on at least stable core and stable, particularly the components that our own software uses within the communicating the API server. Um, go ahead. Yes. I just want to say that is so incredibly cool the way you've been able to do the analysis and, and zoom in on where the response and efficiencies are. It, it's just awesome. So thank you so much. Thank you, Brad. I, I, I have, it's just been that my team and Aaron and a couple other folks who've taken the time to dig in in the really hard ways. What I'm super interested in is seeing what analysis our community can do now that we can easily define where these audit logs are coming from um, by just going into the API snoop and creating a PR, you can modify which jobs that the data is coming from. And when you have inside your PR without even asking us, there'll be a Netlify job and you can browse through and say, well, we regex out here for our stuff and, and, and find some interesting things with what we currently have. Um, there are questions that we can't answer yet even if you were to submit PRs against the different things or give different links to API Snoop. And that's what I wanted to kind of see what we could do next and do better. Um, so these are additional questions that uh, we've thought of. And then after that, I want to see what other questions we can come up with as a community. Um, we've been focusing somewhat on the API kinds and objects and parameters. And so, but we should probably see what our community is doing. And I've, I've, I've asked this question before, but we've kind of never been in a place to, to aggregate that in, and I wanted to get some feedback before we start answering that. If we did know which API objects and kinds were heavily used, we could prioritize those. And one simple way of prioritizing those is based on Aaron's suggestion of uh, analyzing the stable Helm chart manifest. So that's an obvious next step. Another one, um, that we tell the conversations on is the fields and parameters. So when our applications are using the Kubernetes API, there's many different fields and parameters within each of the objects and kinds that uh, we are exploring. Um, if we knew which ones were used, we could identify and prioritize the optional and mandatory fields um, and, and have these patterns of usage. These would encourage us to write tests for things that are heavily used. Um, another ask, that I've seen is what's changed since last week? We have these nice bars up into the right, but um, as we're doing test coverage, it's not just about how many endpoints did we do, uh, what is the new name of the test, um, but what new parameters are we covering? What new behaviors are we covering? Who was involved in the changes this last week? Um, we can measure many things there. So this is identifying coverage and parameter and and field coverage, but also who is doing the work? Because I think we need to acknowledge the, the people doing the, the, heavy, the hard yards here. Um, those are the three general direction questions we had, but since I've kind of given some ideas on how you can explore our current data, and um, I could go, if you want to, I can show you how to change, but we're, we're pulling from release blocking for, for, the, rele for um, the CI jobs. So, what queries we might do, what are the data sets we might pull from, and what other questions we might ask. Um, otherwise, that's, that's, um, that's us. Any questions uh, regarding API Snoop before we move on? Um, one thing we've talked about before is the doing the field introspection so we can tell more what those resources look like because there's a mm -hmm. lot of different behaviors of an individual resource. But even taking that a step further, I wonder if there's a way we can look at interactions between, so, so if there's a single test that creates multiple resources um, and, and then multiple configurations of those different resources, I, I don't know if it's useful, but maybe we can at least get an idea of uh, a, coverage of some of those interactions and behaviors from this? We've thought long and hard about that since we had those discussions and, and the, the II and the API Snoop team have, have uh, thought about extending how we capture those audit logs. Right now we're just analyzing the entire end-to-end -end, uh, suites when they run during release blocking jobs and the like. But some more interesting stories might be 
um, looking at the documentation that we have and uh, taking that little snippet and writing the kubectl commands that go through and perform the expected behaviors that we have written in, in, in our documentation. And uh, having those uh, audit logs processed via API stream to say, this is what we're doing here, and we, you know, this, it's a good test to write. It doesn't write the test, but it gives us this identification of behaviors based on um, uh, flows. And uh, I think at some point in the near future, we'll be, be presenting this to SIGARCH or, or other people too for inclusion. Well, that was a, so I, I think you're, you are planning on um, scheduling a time for both SIG architecture yep. and maybe also the Kubernetes community call for a wider yes. look at it. Yes, that'll be in the next, uh, next month or so. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have uh, Srinivas to talk about the validation suites. Okay, I probably will switch uh, between uh, validation suite uh, and some some other uh, PRs uh, that is outstanding. But in general, this is uh, not really uh, a conformance related, but gen general idea that during our discussion in uh, Seattle, um, conformance uh, deep dive session. Uh, we realize that we should have validation test suites. They are something like uh, what we have today for node, node conformance. Uh, there are a suite of tests for node conformance. Uh, similarly, va validation uh, suites are a set of E2E tests. Uh, they are grouped based off of a specific functionality. Um, and usually the SIGs are responsible for, uh, for driving this work. Uh, for example, like uh, uh, SIG storage, uh, they have CSI today. Uh, if you want to test CSI functionality, you need to have a set of procedures how to set up. And this is not expected to be a core functionality of Kubernetes, but the CSI functionality, for example, right? Uh, how you set up your driver and how you define your storage class or whatnot. Uh, so uh, validation uh, suites um, will be written by SIG storage with a set of documentation how to set up to run that suite. These validation su suites can shrink or grow and they don't have any deprecation policy. They don't belong to conformance they do not require any certification. So that means as you evolve your feature or functionality, there may be more tests added or functionality changes from release to release, you can change the tests or delete some of the tests that are relevant to that functionality. Um, and six are responsible for, for defining the functionality as well as how to run them. That's uh, um, what the idea here is. When you promote these validation tests uh, to conformance, we have to pay attention to whether that particular test belongs to the core feature of the, of the Kubernetes. So uh, some of the node conformance tests, for example, in one of the slides that Aaron did also, we've, we promoted one of the uh, node conformance tests into conformance test suite, uh, which, we, which is part of the code functionality. So similar things can happen to validation tests. And it brings us closer to promoting to conformance. That's the basic idea. So once you have validation suites, we know exactly how to group the functionalities 
and then we can think whether the behaviors belong to the core functionality, so easy to promote. So the idea is also that uh, we want to document them pro properly. So we expect the, the vendors to run validation test suites, so they, it has to be much more user friendly. That way uh, you don't have to look at the code to understand what the test does, but generally um, the documentation should help. And, uh, the, um, the proposal is, uh, Brad wrote uh, the proposal, um, the PR, uh, for how validation test suites should work, and I'll, uh, I'll actually show the PR in a second, but uh, to continue on this, what validation test documentation should look like, similar to conformance test documentation. Uh, we will say when this test is introduced, uh, what the test name should, B, uh, like you see, the core functionality it is testing is CSI attached. There could be multiple tests under CSI attached. Each of them will have a good description of what the test does from an end user perspective so that uh, uh, it really explains what the functionality um, to the end user so that uh, we can generate a document uh, for each of the suites. Um, that will allow us to have better readability of each of the validation suites, um, make it more end user friendly, and group those tests to see what the behavior we're testing. Um, how to run the validation test suites. Um, think of it, I mean, the SIG will define how to run the validation test suite, but generally, um, today, conformance is a Ginkgo focus on conformance. Similarly, you'll have Ginkgo focus CSI validation tests, or Ginkgo focus, node validation tests, whatnot. So uh, that's the whole idea. This is, uh, uh, there is a PR um, uh, still um, I referred in the slide deck, I'll post shortly um, with Brad Topolopin. And uh, feel free to discuss your viewpoints on this PR. This PR is ready for uh, review final reviews, actually. Um, if I may, uh, I'll also talk about um, the project board a little bit. Um, so uh, like Aaron said, we have in improved uh, our communication a little bit better in, the, in this quarter. And we have uh, a conformance uh, sub-project work group meeting every bi-weekly, actually. And most of the work we are doing um, is, uh, is basically um, going through oh, one second. Um, CNCF project work board. So this is how complex it is. All the conformance tests today, all the conformance work you can see in here. I mean, uh, there is a notion that conformance uh, test suite is pretty static. It's not going to change. but. It is not true. Basically, a lot of conformance tests are being added, right? So um, to get a better view for end user, they can go to the project work board for conformance. And there is a process of the, the, the life cycle of a PR that's coming into conformance um, under area conformance uh, goes through this. Um, there are a set of uh, high-level tracking issues, and then um, like um, uh, tracking issues on conformance coverage for Q proxy or other function areas. And um, then we'll go through them in the, in the work group meeting. Um, and uh, we, we, we identify what the priorities are. Right now we are working on uh, uh, pod spec coverage. Um, and um, as the PRs, uh, we, there are a lot of PRs coming in the pod spec coverage right now, and they are going through the in progress and in review where the six as well as conformance folks are reviewing these PRs, and eventually they'll go into needs approval column where um, the actual conformance leads will approve the PR. That's when the conformance test goes into that release. So uh, it's, a, it's a much more complex process uh, that uh, a conformance promotion 
for an E2E goes through. And, we're all, it, uh, and also, uh, there are, uh, as we see, and um, as the hippie hacker um, um, talked about, um, we need to write new E2E tests to fill the gaps. Um, and uh, then we have to then promote that test into the, into the conformance uh, during the next release cycle. So, um, um, so to automate this, there are a couple ways we are working on. Uh, those are, again, outstanding PRs. Uh, as soon as there is an issue, uh, for example, in this case, um, you can assign the issue to the project board. So there is a prow plugin that is under works. Um, it's, it's basically a uh, couple PRs outstanding right now. So you can use commands like slash project um, and uh, add your prow plugin to, sorry. Um, use that prop plugin to basically add this uh, to a, a test project, like, um, or to the real project. <laughs> um, if I add it to a particular um, um, project, like, for example, conformance project, uh, that particular issue gets added to the um, to the project board, um, I don't know, um, I'm probably in a wrong project here, so. Oh yeah, it, uh, the issue gets added automatically to the project board. That's one way we are managing. Uh, the other way we are managing it is through automated way. So each of the conformance tests will be under area conformance. So when a PR get, uh, comes in, you tag the PR to area conformance. Um, so that way, um, when you tag, this is just uh, my test bed. So uh, as soon as you tag the PR, the PR will show up right here uh, in the project board. There are ways we are automating this process so that uh, uh, it, it at least shows up for us to, to start working on it and triaging it and moving it through that life cycle I showed you. That's all I have. Any questions? Thank you, Srinivas. And uh, let's just quickly check in on that uh, Sooner Boy run. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> stay, stay around. Uh, looks like it's still running. Uh, so if I wanted to, if I wanted to dig into that a bit more in a bit more detail, I can uh, just do the see the live logs as, as they're streaming in. No one's um, allowed to leave until. Yeah, just to prove to you that uh, that this is real. All right. So next on the list, we have John um, to talk about the, conformance, the development of conformance tests. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So um, one thing we've been talking about a lot in the meetings is around um, how we measure coverage. And API Snoop is one way we do that. But part of the problem is that we haven't really documented all of the things we're trying to cover. So you can have tests, but if you don't know the, the universe that you're trying to test, you don't know how much of that universe you've covered. So, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, how we identify that and how we target our tests, how we build our tests. So as I see it, sort of the very overall high level process consists of you know, de developing the tests, which includes identifying what they should be, um, executing them, the results evaluation, the re results reporting, and then eventually some sort of evaluation of workload portability. So all of these have been brought up, I think, by previous people. Um, I wanted to talk really just on the test development and, and just briefly. Um, I, I tend to think of this in uh, these four stages for the development of the test. One is just identifying the behaviors we want to test, um, classifying them, and, and this gets into the validation suites. Some of them get 
get validated. These aren't even necessarily conforming behaviors, it's just in testing in general. Um, developing the test to cover those things and measuring the coverage against our, our list. So uh, the couple of things I wanted to, to point out here or discuss, um, the things in green are the things we're actually doing right now as part of this conformance program. So we're promoting existing end-to-end -end tests. Maybe we're also writing some new tests. Um, that should probably be green. But um, as far as, as identifying the behaviors, we're just looking at the existing end-to-end -end tests. We're not really documenting the, the behaviors from a more holistic point of view, um, at least not beyond what, what's out there, right? All of that's out there in the docs. All of it's out there. There's, there's a lot embedded in the API schema um, and of course the code. And, and really there's still a lot of stuff that's just in individual people's heads on how all this stuff should work. And so what I'm proposing is that we, we make a, a sort of, we step back a little bit, make a concerted effort to, um, to come up with how we're, or to, to come up with new ways to identify the tests and new ways to document in a machine readable way what those tests are. And then that can flow through. We can classify them into um, their feature, associated features. So, um, it, and then we can classify which of those are actually, should be uh, conformance related. The, the people who are, need to review and approve whether a given behavior should be a conformance behavior or is, or is not uh, required for conformance, I think is a different and very small select group of people um, who have very low bandwidth because they're so, so committed to other things. And so uh, part of the goal I'd like to uh, achieve is separating the review process for the um, identification of those behaviors from the review process of we have a test for it and that test accurately tests that behavior. I think a lot more people can do that second thing and that second thing actually is a lot of work, right? It's, it's a, it, it, you, can, you can state a behavior, uh, if you go to the API documents and you just pick out a field, there's a statement of the behavior of what that field does. And um, that's pretty easy for someone to say yes or no, that should be part of conformance. Whereas actually reading the test that evaluates that behavior and, and in different circumstances and making sure it works and follows all the conformance test guidelines is a substantially more, uh, more work. So um, in any case, uh, this is kind of really was just intended to start the discussion or, or continue the discussion that we've had. Um, what I would like to come out of maybe, uh, I, I guess I expected this to be less presentation and more discussion. And so what I would hope we can come out after the deep dive, after this part of it is some consensus on, um, on approach. And at that point, you know, uh, we can start to formalize it into something more in the cap. So any questions on this or comments? There you go. Uh, so I think what you're proposing generally uh, is to flip the model from someone goes off and does a lot of work to uh, clean up and propose that a conformance test be merged into the white gold list of conformance tests. And only then do folks in uh, SIG architecture say, actually, no, this isn't quite right. That's not what we're trying to focus on. Right. Uh, and flip that upside down so that those folks seed the prioritization by going and saying yes, yes, no, yes, yes, and in this order. Uh, and then we, know we have a guidance on where to start. Not that we uh, skip the last step anyway, but at least we start with some context. We, we start with context and we know what's, we can, we, it can help prioritize and it can help um, measure what progress we've made because we know that's exactly right. I mean, it's, it's, it, and they don't have to be serial processes, right? We can continue um, a lot of the work we're doing. It's just that what I'm suggesting is that we should also be uh, trying to do that upfront work to decide on what our end goal is. And if we can identify, right now we don't know, we could keep writing end-to-end -to tests till the end of time and we don't know if we've covered everything because we don't, have any real way to measure that. 
Um, we can use some after the fact things, which we're trying to do with API Snoop, but how do you measure, this is kind of what I was getting at before, if, if uh, pod to pod networking, right? That's not, that's something we require, but it's not something you can measure um, in a test that just checks an API field, right? So there's, there's just, it's, a, it's something somebody has to think of to, to put a, a test down on, and I think that we're not formalizing that process of thinking and documenting what, what those are. We have them in some umbrella issues and things like that, but it, it's just very difficult to track whether we've covered them. So pod to pod networking aside, maybe we get a head start by using the output from the API Snoop exercise and say, here's the stable core functionality. Can you look through this list of 125 and pick the seven that probably don't need to be part of the conformance test suite? Uh, is that something how like that? Yeah. Start? In fact, I would I would probably go the other way. I would start from our API schema, because the schema is already very it's already machine digestible, and now we can go through that and we can identify. I mean, actually, some of the the Globink guys did this. They went through and did it by hand, right? Okay, let's go through the API schema. Here's all the different um, uh, API fields in pod spec, and we're going to need tests for every one of these. And some of them have tests today. Some of them don't. A lot of times there's interactions between them that aren't tested. Um, so you can get a start um, by going through that API schema and just spitting out a bunch of tests. You still have to see which ones are covered and which aren't. Um, you can also, and partly you can do that through the API Snoop. You can see what, what's been covered, especially if we add the field introspection there. Um, so I, I think there's, that's, that's like, to me, the, the API Snoop piece gets into the measuring the coverage. Um, the way we can identify behaviors, I think it's just got to be an active process of we need to have, a, you know, uh, a concerted effort to put, create some tooling around the API schema to uh, go through the docs and to, to, to write these things down. Um, I, I'd love a suggestion that would purely automate it, but I have yet to hear one. So we, we did, there is a uh, PR that died a death of lagging into oblivion, uh, where we tried to do a data-driven, go through all the APIs and, and uh, validate that we can create, we can do all CRUD operations on all objects. Right. Um, the value of that was kind of unclear, uh, but it might be worth at least looking into that. Could I uh, ask you about that for a second? Because um, Ryan Grant, uh, Name will take in vain. Always. Uh, yeah. Thanks, uh, William. So starting again, um, Brian Grant, whose name will take in vain here, always seems to hate the idea of uh, just doing this naive um, walking the open API tree and trying to run the acceptable verbs against the uh, uh, available uh, endpoints. And obviously, there's no payload and there's no intelligence to it. But I, I, I've never quite understood why it's uh, bad as a step to have what you would call extremely shallow testing as opposed to the much deeper testing that, that we're focused on. In particular, in, in a scenario where we're worried about vendors turning off APIs. And I mean, very explicitly, uh, when we launched the certified Kubernetes program, we had major vendors, platinum members of CNCF, who had turned off APIs for good internal reasons that turned them back on so that they could pass the certification test. And it seems to me like the incredibly silly, naive, shallow testing would actually catch that. Yeah, I, I obviously am in agreement. Uh, it was <laughs> a starter project for someone on our team. Uh, they got pretty far on it and then abandoned it for basically this reason because there wasn't uh, general buy-in. I've never thought of it as sufficient, but it that's seems like the, a, a reasonable thought. first step. If you can't pass this, then it's no reason to go on to the behaviors. And I think we need a clearer definition of the distinction between API contract and behavior. I think that uh, has been raised, but I, I, we haven't formally defined. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that gets to sort of the, there's, I, I, I agree, I don't see that as, it's not harmful to have that and it's, it's relatively easy to do, right? Um, but it doesn't, it may give a false sense of confidence if it's your only signal. But if you've got, 
so it's not sufficient. We yeah. all know that. We all agree with that. Um, the, Could the, we maybe escalate it back to yeah, the we, cigar? We can, we can resurrect it. I think you got most of the way through uh -huh. it, so I can dig it up and, and pass it around yeah, again. That would be, and, I mean, we could have Globin work on it, or maybe you'd have a junior person. or It's almost like a GSOC kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing that um, Diego brought up, uh, there's a distinction here between horizontal and vertical features. So like the API functionality, the API, really it's sort of vertical and API machinery, but that's a horizontal function. So the, the API machinery, the way the API works, the way that the REST API with JSON versus protobuf and watches and all that work are not specific to any vertical API or functionality. And those, those you're not going to get out of an API schema, right? Those are, those are things that have to be documented by, uh, by people. And, um, and so, you know, that's, uh, I sort of wasn't sure whether I should put those horizontal vertical feature stuff under identify or classify, but it's just a way that I, I tend to think about it when I'm trying to say, okay, what are all the behaviors? I can put this in this bucket and, the, and I can't do API schema walks for that. Um, and even for the, even for the vertical things, you can only do, it's only like one step deeper than the, than what we were just talking about to just walk the API schema. Like you, you don't get those complex interactions. Did you want to say something, Hippie? Under the identifying behaviors and developing tests um, we've been talking about, um, instead of automatically um, going through the API spec or, or the schema, um, we spent the last week or so um, looking at some of your suggestions on using the documentation as a driver mm -hmm. for our behaviors. And we spent some time um, uh, adapting the existing Kubernetes documentation in a form that would be executable. And when you go through and, and follow the steps defined in the documentation, it, against the living cluster, it performs these operations. And if you go through and actually test with kubectl, just simple non-programmer uh, interactions to, to document that, it, it, we've thought about a way to turn on the API snoop, the audit logging before. And then we go through and it executes these, these behaviors and then it stops and we have that very precise focused API snoop analysis on, on a test that a behavior that could be actually incorporated into our documentation. Mm -hmm. And that would allow us to put like a GSOC style folks onto go through all of the existing Kubernetes documentation and augment it with this metadata that can express that behavior in a way that we could have some automation to show either the API snoop graph or a set of, 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 of now behaviors that are, are driven from our expected user experience. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think that would be really interesting. That, that's sort of like the documentation is an identify and then there's the, which the, we talked about the executable docs you're talking about there. And that would be sort of like, as you're going through and identifying these tests rather than just adding them to some list somewhere, you could actually convert them into some executable test right then and there. Um, I think there's value in that. I think that you'll probably find a lot of the examples don't work. But um, the, uh, my only real concern there is that those are again scattered everywhere throughout the documentation and there's not like one place. Maybe you can have tooling that pulls them all together. But th th those are very user oriented and how do you say uh, this sequence of five steps um, is one conformance test. To me, that's a little bit, it's a great end-to-end -end test maybe. I'm not sure if it's one conformance, if, the, if it gets the conformance tag, but it's something, it's debatable. In my head, when I see that this is the, the way that you lead end users to walk through and use Kubernetes, if that's not part of the definition for Kubernetes, it feels, it makes me feel, I don't know how it makes me feel. I, I, no, no, what I, what I would suggest is that those are composed of multiple conformance tests. Sure, As sure. opposed to being a single conformance test themselves. That's, that's kind of what I meant. So it's, um, oh, we lost it here. Um, so I guess where I, where I would want to go with this is uh, get the feeling of the room here. Um, I'm happy to start working on trying to formalize this some more and I mean, I think a big problem we've had in this group is staffing. 
Um, and I know we've got some contractors to help with some things. But I think we need to have a little more structure around guiding them. So um, that's what I'm hoping to do here. And uh, you know, any other, I, to me, this fits very well with what you were talking about, ScreenOS, because basically you tag these different behaviors and you categorize them into those features, and those are the validation tests, because, and, and then a subset get tagged as conformance. Yeah. I think uh, it would be great to identify some big themes in addition to the stable core. Uh, I would propose security as a topic where portability of uh, security policy would be important to end users. Uh, and this is just becoming more of a concern as there are more vulnerabilities exposed uh, and publishing best practices and how, to, how, how do we ensure that those best practices can be adopted uh, by end users in all of these conformant clusters. Uh, it typically is uh, an exercise of just testing that it works and if it doesn't, I think all providers are incentivized to make sure that that works anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so this would be an area of focus that I would like to propose and, and prioritize going forward. I think that, that makes sense. Um, I, one thing, uh, speaking of areas of focus, like one of the things, areas where there's a likely variation between vendors or between distributors, like with all the plugins, and I'm wondering, I was looking, thinking about what you had with your the, CS, uh, the CSI testing, and I guess I'm wondering if we should have some sort of um, mock, maybe they already do in the CS, maybe the CSI guys already have it, some sort of mock CSI driver that we can test the machinery of, of Kubernetes. And then when, but when somebody goes and runs a conformance test with a particular CSI driver, you can more easily sort of. Yeah, that is the expected behavior. Basically, what we want to do is we have a common set of functionality that uh, we can test it on any uh, cluster. Can and you speak a little more closely to the mic? Is Sorry. It? Uh, so uh, when it comes to the the actual vendor environment, they should be able to test it uh, with the real driver in that in that sense. Um, Sounds like you want to merge in a dev null driver. Yeah, something like that. And I, but I wonder about the um, the the conformance testing right now runs through those end-to-end -end tests. This might get into the um, how we execute the tests, like. When we run those, maybe this is already, I, I'm just not quite familiar enough, but if, if I create my cluster, I guess it, it, you create your cluster ahead of time, so you create it with whatever CSI driver and whatever CNI driver you want, and then you run those tests and we see what happens. So I guess it's, it is covered Agreed. in that way. Yeah. yeah, part of the problem right now for, for the work on conformance is that Behaviors are hard to pick from from just the API documentation. So um, we need to actively start building that uh, so that we can have a healthy pipeline of work. Because yeah. there are, like you said, uh, we have enough of people to work on generating the ETA test cases, but. Uh, or initially, it is a lot easier for us to go through all the ETA tests and see what can be promoted. But as we go further and further. I, I'm questioning that a little bit, actually, because as we go through those end-to-end -end tests, like we saw on those, those graphs here, the 126 comments. And a lot of those, I know what they are, because it's me and Patrick and some other folks in the room saying, well, we need, should split this because it's Windows, and that part works in Windows, and that part doesn't, and we should split it up. And it's like all this pre-work that, that it's actually writing new EDE e e tests is what it comes down to. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think if we have that, that, that driven list uh, or that prioritized list, we can look at um, what, what EDE e tests already meet those. But a lot of them do stuff that you, they were written without conformance in mind. So they do stuff that's, that's true. It's like yeah. um, and all that kind of stuff. Right, yeah. Is, so, so one pattern that seemed to work well was leaning on the SIGs to self-identify what was core to their SIG functionality. And I think the uh, validation suites might be a good mechanism to go back to the SIGs. Uh, I think Aaron pointed out that API machinery and apps are both in my group at Google, and I <laughs> essentially could decide and announce what some folks were working on at that time. 
Uh, and so there was a lot of activity there. And they were high value tests because the API machinery team recognized that watch and garbage collection were critical to the functionality of the API server. Uh, and so they prioritized their own list, not just what are the EDE tests that exist and which ones match most closely to a small footprint test. So in the security case, uh, maybe we can go to the uh, security SIG and say, this is the validation suite. Can you, you know, RBAC, what, what does it mean for RBAC to work? Are there already RBAC tests that could be promoted? Uh, and have them go through the exercises, the subject matter experts. Uh, and that seems to work much better, especially as uh, Kubernetes gets more uh, states' rights rather than federal government ties. <laughs> uh, they, they do have a lot more context than folks trying to go across the whole service area. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, um, we do have umbrella issues for uh, conformance, but we do not have similar thing for the six. So it's not under the radar right now for them to actively start working on um, on anything that would be promoted in the future, right? So six are fine with, uh, they added the functionality, they added uh, E2Es, uh, but they probably won't see all the gaps that we are looking at. And so one of the things we did do is we added that if you want to promote your, your uh, feature to GA, you need to add some conformance tests, and I think as we if we can formalize the, the concept of behaviors, we can, you know, we can spread this, this load across everybody, which is what's needed. That's actually a good idea. I mean, backfilling is one problem we have, but uh, for the future work like CSI, we can definitely handle this. But right. How is that? <clears throat> how is that going so far? I'm very curious to know about that because, like, I think we've spent a lot of time talking about the backfill. In theory, in a perfect world. Every single feature going to GA would have 100% coverage, and so, so our attention is only... So that just merged into the KEP template, like, what, a month ago? Okay. I don't, I don't remember who did it, but... Um, uh, so I, I don't know. Okay, uh, that's, definitely, that's <laughs> definitely very new. I, I guess... Well, let me ask, looking forward then, for the next release of Kubernetes, Right. will it be true that every feature that gets promoted has tests? And if not, can we make it true? I think we need to because make it. Tr we, we, we need th it's what we need to get reviewers. I guess maybe we need to educate SIG reviewers and approvers yeah. on this, and because they're not going back and looking at the template every every right. time they so do a review, right? Yeah. So, no, but it, I'm wondering if we could assign this to Hippie. Yeah. Is it feasible with API Snoop in the right regex to look at a new uh, features that have come in in the last quarter and then confirming that they do have tests? The, uh, uh, what if we could see what was different from last week and look at any new endpoints or any new APIs? Because um, I, I do want to state here that the, the CNCF governing board, and CCF and the LF, have a philosophy not to pay for mm. software development, that we see that as the key function of the members. Mm. And we specifically made an exception in this case, and there was a uh, explicit agreement with the Kubernetes steering committee and SIG architecture to have a change in policy uh, as a result, which it, it's, yeah, unfortunately it's only one line, and if it's not enforced by trial, then it's it, it, not There is a change of policy, it's just whether that. Yeah, we, it's yeah. Been correctly honored. Uh, and, yeah, yeah, how yeah. We, I, I'm really hoping that we can enforce it, because I think like all the interests are actually aligned yes. for new features. So the feature owner wants to get their feature in Kubernetes. So if, if we say, well, it needs a test. Well, and specifically, they want to get it from beta to GA. Right. That's, that's right, the because point. until it's GA, yeah. it's not universally usable. And so I think, like, they are extremely incentivized to add tests. Definitely. And, and, and particularly if it's a blocker. The other thing is that they're also the right person to add the test because yeah. they're the expert. So I think, like, all and, the incentives. And it's also the right time when they still remember how the code works. And it's the right time because, <laughs> like, you know, conformance aside, everything yeah. should have tests. So I think, like... It would be crazy for us not to enforce that. So, right. so I guess, like, I just wonder, like, you know, okay, a month ago we added that. Can, can we just what step, tooling, yeah. can we step up enforcement to one hundred percent for the next release? Like, is there is a reason not to do that? I don't think there's a reason not to and do like, it. It's just the mechanism. It's just, yeah, yeah, it's just formalizing the process so that it doesn't get missed. Uh, I know it's top of my, the two that are on my radar right now are the extensibility features, CRDs, and getting those to GA uh, and ingress, which is a really tricky one. Uh, and those, getting those to GA by the end of 2019, uh, part of that discussion and plan all along has been the conformance tests as part of that. Uh, 
And so folks who do a lot of the reviews are keeping that in mind. We also do scale testing when it goes to stable, which never happens before that. Uh, and I think getting all of the required APIs to stable uh, or GA means that they get backwards compatibility guarantees and it means they get scale tested. Uh, so this is really important to our bigger customers and I'm sure everyone else's. Yeah. And can we go ahead and um, look at everything that's gone GA in the last year? Yeah, webhooks I think just did and I, that was the one I'll, I'll yeah. follow and up on that one. I don't know if it did actually. See if we can it have uh, SIG architecture scheduled for deprecation <laughs> unless they uh, <laughs> stick. deliver performance yeah, tests. Dan goes with the <laughs> carrot <laughs> and the stick. <laughs> that, yeah, that's a stick. I, there, there are some things I think we're going to have to work out, though, because we have this uh, policy in the conformance test that says that in order for something to be a conformance test, it has to have been an end-to-end -end test that has existed for at least one release and shows ah. that it's not flaky. <laughs> so if it's a new feature, so that means they really should be adding it when they go to beta, and it should show that it's not a flaky test so that when they go to GA, it can be promoted. So, so I I'm sure nobody's thinking that when they're going to that, beta. I agree with that statement. One, I think we need to revise that rule so there's an exception for, for new features. For features, if I mean, if the test go, goes with the feature, that that should be okay. But I actually agree with you. I think these tests should exist in the beta. And in fact, I'd like to see Sooner Boy have kind of an optional, like beta option, right? Where you you get like the definitive conformance result, right? <laughs> and then you kind of get like a tentative result for features that are coming down the pipeline. So if ideally if these tests do exist in beta, notice, right? you get some notice. You'd be like, oh, this one's failing, which is your cue to go to the community. Well, it'd either like check to see why it's failing and, and right. if, if, if there's a legitimate reason, fix that reason. If you think the bug is in the test, which does happen sometimes, then you've got a window to actually go to the community and say, hey, I'm seeing a problem with this test. Who else is seeing this? And so then we have some notice. Um, and, and also, it get, yeah, it gives the people the opportunity to say, well, before you go GA, can we work out this problem? Yeah, so, so I, I, so actually, distribution. Like ideally, I'd like to see this in the KEP proposal. Like, maybe we can <laughs> incrementally start adding these things. But I'd like to say, actually, like, why are we promoting things to beta without tests? Like, to me, that doesn't actually make sense. Alpha, I kind of get, but, but I'd like to see the, the beta promotion has the test, and then it's that same test, you know, getting finalized in GA. And, yeah. Um, so would one of the three of you be willing to take on a, like, it's, sure. it's, a, it's a modification to the yeah, KEP? Uh, what I mean, are talking about? I'd be happy to get that one going. Sure, yeah, yeah. Great. I mean, I, I do worry, like, we add more and more gates in the cap, and, and then people get frustrated, and then they sneak things past I, it. And they I think these are the gates that we should have. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I mean, what are you I mean, gonna I mean do? obviously, you like, what are we, what are we doing? Right. You know, if, you, if you're not writing tests for your stuff, oh, yeah. let's all just go home. I, yeah, I agree with that. I, I, it, you know, this is, to me, this is not process. This is actually just software engineering best practice. <laughs> Yeah. So. I, I don't think it's the case that we have beta, like actual beta functionality that has no tests. I, I think our Did API I, I, reviewers. I very I strongly suspect we have beta functionality that has tests that they never got around to promoting I, some to be conformance. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Yeah, and that, and that may not meet conformance criteria, right? They may be doing stuff in them that's right. not. That we can't do on a conformance test because they're looking at some event or they're looking at. So that's yeah, to clarify the everything that's I said in, was in the conformance the context. Yeah. I yeah. Fast comment about this. So basically, I would like like I, I I used to develop platform which was conformant, and I would really love to see that at least no conformant test that will go that become conformant with next version and run them in my cluster in advance. So I won't have some surprises because we. We had some, there was a bug in Kubernetes when it dif didn't work on conformance test when you have proxy environment variable. And like because of it, we had to do like notion, okay, it doesn't work when you have proxy environment variable, but in next version of Kubernetes, it will work, so we have to change our CI to skip the test and nada, nada, nada. I would really love to test it a little bit in advance. Like, okay, this will be conformance test. Uh, it's fine with my cluster. I can raise it with the Kubernetes community in advance and not after the fact and I plan to update to next version and to run it and yeah. Yeah. So just one one other comment on this. Uh, if folks are not aware, as part of the SIG cloud provider, uh, we work with SIG testing to open up test grids such that providers can run the conformance test suite in their own environments and submit the results back to test grid and show up as part of an overall dashboard of all the conformance tests that are run on all of the environments. Uh, and this is how uh, cloud providers get early warning that someone else inadvertently broke their implementation 
or that a conformance test doesn't work on the, uh, some upcoming version. Uh, I think the notion that we've talked about in this group before but need to reinvest is on the beta conformance test uh, labels. And that's something that we don't have now that we, it sounds like it would be really helpful and maybe this is the right time. Any, any last thoughts? Uh, we're about to wrap up. Uh, uh, one thing I wanted to point out, basically for beta, should we be more concerned about what the coverage is uh, rather than thinking about conformance at that point in time? I, I think the proposal here that I agree with is uh, to consider the EDE tests that are being proposed for a beta API in the context of conformance and what would be the additional work to promote that to conformance. And we push that discussion upstream rather than waiting until someone's hopes and dreams are ongoing GA and 116 and then they get feedback that it needs a conformance test and this isn't gonna cut it. Because uh, that's a very <coughs> discouraging process to go through. Is that right, John? Yeah. John's not. Uh, I agree, we should definitely bring it forward but at the same time also that, that risk is also a huge motivation. Uh, <laughs> but, but I agree with you. Okay, so I hate to, I hate to cut it short, um, just getting to a good discussion, but hopefully, we, hopefully everyone can take this energy forward and, uh, and we, can, we can improve all, all the work collaboratively. Um, but we can't leave yet. <laughs> ah, okay, one, <laughs> one last thing to check. All right, all right. Is it done? I, I literally have a plane, plane in 90 minutes that I'm gonna miss here. All right, so, oh. so you, you may have the most on the line. Um, <laughs> let's see. It is still running. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Dan. I, <laughs> I hope that was a short flight. Um, th thank you, everyone. It's it's been great. Uh, let's let's keep the energy going offline, uh, well, online. Cool. See, I told you it's more than 60, 60 minutes, yeah. right? <laughs> I meant it. <laughs>